better, but I'm just going to use Don for this. And <laughs> <laughs> you are not so completely many obsolete. It's a family business. So, um, basically, what the, the the framing of the presentation here is that I've got a couple of cases that sort of represent uh, a type of customer I'm wrestling with right now, and I want to explore what I think the pain is with this customer and sort of try to illuminate that and where I am. And then I've been thinking through what I'm going to do in terms of solving it, but I, you know, I'm open to feedback there because it's still um, relatively early in the process. And so, what I hope you guys get out of it is maybe a glimpse into, into uh, this new sort of type of customer as well as what if I have any thoughts that are useful to spark some of your thoughts or in the conversation afterwards that that's really what I'd like to do. And obviously that's useful for me. So um, in terms of the timing of this, I, I want to at least have a half hour conversation at the end of this. It's about an hour and a half here, but I'll try to finish up sort of my piece as quickly as I can. I'm not quite sure how long it'll take because I'm just thinking out loud based on some prompts. So, so the three cases I have, um, I've got three customers and now they're in very different industries, but the core problem is the same. And so the first one is a, a, they sell complex equipment. So they're essentially doing uh, wastewater and water treatment. And they're selling very, you know, got a, a ton of SKUs of different types of products at all very different sizes. But to give you a sense of this, they're selling between 1.5 and $5 million per pop. And they're trying to figure out their marketing plan, but they've been uh, able to be profitable to the point now where they're scaling. But to give you a sense of their issue is they've, they've got a team of about four or five people doing this. They have the capacity to deliver on two or three of these at a time and it takes about a year once you've made the sale to actually get the thing up and running. And their thing is they're expecting based on some of the feeling they've got from um, their sales and marketing so far and, and the inroads they've made into certain communities that start to compound that they're going to be selling 50 of these in two years and they can only handle three. So you get a sense of how the hell do we build an organization to deal with this? How do I find the people? How, how do we work together? Like this is, um, and the issue that you find that's interesting is there's a, sometimes a cash flow problem depending on the financing behind it, um, but really their problem is time, and it's not not nearly as much at cost. So, so that's one example. The other one's a SaaS company, which is software as a service. So this is traditional. You think of Silicon Valley, you think of Salesforce, you think of whatever any of those type of things. So this company does. Um, they're building uh, stuff for tenant engagement, and which is essentially, I guess the, the main point here is they have a proposal out right now which they have a very high likelihood of landing, which would move their um, need for tech people, which is right now at two, to 100 in the next two years. And that's just on the tech side, and then you have to build the infrastructure organizationally around that to deliver, to build up to this scale globally. So it's like, with one sale, they can move from being a North American company to being a global company. And <laughs> you get a sense of the issue. So there's the same thing here. I'm working with a not-for-profit that does, uh, um, they, they're basically selling a system that's a social program that helps uh, intervene with delinquent youths before they're 12. And it is very effective at preventing them from going to jail or dying, <coughs> which is essentially what you can predict to happen. Now they've been doing it from a scientific perspective, this is sort of a thing where um, the founder has been doing research on this for 35 years and they've got something they've replicated on a number of sites and now they're scaling across Canada, which is going from like 10 sites to 120. But the issue is they're doing that while they're holding off governments from Europe, Australia, Florida, like all there, they're, they're calling and saying, we want this now. And they can barely handle this national scale up. So you get, a, you get a sense of this, these are the type of cases I'm dealing with. And so I'm, I'm, um, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. So, so I sort of described this as, this is, so some of you may know, uh, at Ryerson I, I completed a degree in entrepreneurship and strategy. And so this is sort of my own model of how I think about sort of the entrepreneurial journey. It's very low resolution. Um, but the idea is that there's a number of hurdles that happen. And, you can think of it conceptually as the first one being problem solution fit. So it's, it's, um, and the second one would be product market. And then you get into the scaling problem, which really where I'm going with my clients is between the product problem. They've got a problem solution, meaning they 
have solved something where either they're getting, uh, they have some sort of revenue, somebody likes it, they, they don't know where the market is. And a lot of the times I sort of intervene there and I help with some strategic clarity business model stuff. But the real problem they're facing is this scale up that's just so quick. Uh, and there's uh, a difference between just scaling sort of a system and getting to a point where you're actually building an organization and trying to refine the systems. So there's the point of, okay, we need 100 people and we need them all to work together. And then once you've sort of done that and the client's happy, now it's like, we're doing this very inefficiently. How do we do this as an organization and how, how are we sustainable? You start thinking more about development and succession and, and those type of things. And so, um, and the last thing I have there is just there's companies that sort of go, I think about it from five to six, where they buy through Kate and start building a portfolio of businesses. But generally where I'm dealing with are right on the cusp of finding their product market fit, which now gives them this whole other host of problems. So five to six in, in our terms, right? Yes, in, in our own terms. So um, from from this perspective, I mean, problem solution fit, traditional thinking, and I know I, there's a lot of people my age coming out of school and a bit older who are using some of this more customer-centric tools, design thinking type stuff to help companies um, figure out exactly what they're doing. I don't do that as much as I, um, I think about my strategic role as saying, here are the hurdles, have you satisfied them? Have you actually, do you have something that's actually valuable? Do you know about your customer? And, but I don't, I don't generally intervene at this stage, but pretty much you can, you, <coughs> the best metric here is somebody's paid you for something or somebody really likes something even if they haven't paid you. Maybe you don't know how, you know, people start using Facebook. It's, you've solved the problem but you don't know what it is. So then, here's all of a sudden a product market fit. You now, I, I describe it as you know who to talk to, what to say to them so you're understanding their value, etc. How to price it and uh, how to find these people so that you can reliably get a sale. So it's sort of like, um, the difference between somebody like this and they paid me, but now I know exactly who likes me, I know where to find them, I can say it to them. So, But then some of the other things that happen is generally there's a good viral coefficient, which is a sort of sales metric of you sell one and all of a sudden those sales lead to more sales. It's a compounding effect. So there's, um, uh, it's sort of like a rule of law or a law of nature of sort of uh, the Pareto uh, distribution where you find that as, as something accumulates mass, more more comes to it. So this is the same for the density of forests, for the size of stars, for how money flows through the economy. As soon as you get something, it's more likely you get something else. So the same thing happens here. You get one customer, you're more likely to get another customer. You get a bit of money, more likely to get more traction. So it seems that, in my mind, what's happening is you've got technological enablers that are, that are making this even more of an effect. And so every company now that's dealing with problems at this level are, are having to contend with that. So what I've been doing simply from a strategic perspective is saying, okay, I will help you get strategic clarity. I don't know your business enough to do this, but I can tell you, I can tell if you actually have done the work from a customer-centric perspective and if you've done sort of some business modeling. And so I've just simply been using Excel to say, let's think this out. How, how is this going to work? How much are they going to pay? And we basically get all the variables, put them in multiple Excel places, and then as they learn more things, we keep track of that. And I find that um, surprisingly effective. It's a pretty simple method of, of doing it. But um, the other thing that I, I like to do is think about that as sort of a modular way. So one of the ways we've found of scaling is you build something that works um, as, as a unit in and of itself, and you get the levels of work right in it, and you get sort of the system working. And that, then you just say, we need to run that script again. So it's like you figure out the first script, then if you want to go to 10 different places, it's it's much more manageable. And the other thing, it's one of my favorite phrases, don't boil the ocean, meaning you pick pick one customer group. So for example, the SaaS company, we're, we're, they're only dealing with commercial real estate from very big players. They're not dealing with residential, they're not dealing with small, they're dealing with very, very specific pieces. And the same with the complex equipment. They're, they're dealing right now with the Aboriginal communities who need the the equipment more than other places. They're not, they don't have the bandwidth to go farther. Um, so anyway, I, the other two things that are very practical, so traditionally people use the business model canvas. It's okay, I think it's not depth, in depth enough, it doesn't have all the variables. Um, well, the one thing I really like is using one pages as tests, and I found with the CEOs I'm dealing with, 
that um, if you get their value prop or what they think it is on the one page and you give that to somebody, then you're much more likely to get objections than just talking to people. So anyway, very simple on the strategic side. <coughs> but this is what people are facing with. So I sort of described this, but this is the traditional thinking when people talk about hockey stick. It's, it's the issue of have you solved the problem, yes or no, but then have you found out who cares about it and as soon as you do, and all of a sudden you have too many of them. So um, it's just a visualization of that. Anyway, so I think of the distinction here is they're going from um, the focus of finding the product to all of a sudden the problem itself is organization building and organization design. Um, and speed's more important, so I, don't know, I think I've covered that. So here's the big thing that I've noticed is the people who I'm dealing with are going from four to five, both in what the work requires, but also that they're personally going through that transition. And so I've come in and they're at different sort of stages in that transition, sort of a multi-year transition in complexity. But what I find is that they're, they're reaching for uh, working on the business itself and that in order to be uh, an entrepreneur in the sense that you're actually building a company, you have to be at five. And you can think about it from a subject-object distinction where when you're at four, you're subject to the business model and the object you're manip manipulating is all the process and structures of the system you're, you're, you're building. So you sort of think like, look, I'm hiring these people here. I've got sort of this development on the product that's happening. I've, I'm, I'm out here doing this sort of sales and marketing. You've got all these processes and you're interrelating them and you figured out the feedback loops. But the business you're in, you haven't even had time to think about. So it's sort of mostly internal looking of how everything's working. And what happens is as you move to five, the object that you start manipulating is what's, what's the business we're in particularly and how do I capture this phrase? Um, so part of it's from a, it's really hard to sell a concept when you don't have a way of um, summarizing it in a nice neat package and sort of at four what I found is you go off on a tangent here and a tangent there and it all relates. In order to say one thing about the system, you have to say everything. And at five, you start to say, here's what we're really doing for you, and then you can drill down. And so there's this, um, there's this need not just for supporting them with organization, but also supporting the transition of the CEO itself, and supporting the um, CEO with people internally at four who can take on the work as working on the business as opposed to in the business. So anyway, this is where I sort of think the complexity stuff comes into entrepreneurship is you can sort of solve a problem at two, but moving, like, there's like, you need to have your uh, value proposition, you need to do sort of some customer, like, there's a bucket of things you can do and you can sort of solve something. But if you're trying to get to a point where you're figuring out who cares about it, it's really more of a process that takes, if you use time span in the complexity, probably a year or two, but if you're using even just the underlying complexity, it takes about that long. And the companies I'm dealing with are sort of at four where they're scaling but they're not handling it well. It's more of a reaction where they've, they've got um, all the pieces there but they haven't sat back and decided which, which way they're going to go with all of it. And so really we're, what we're trying to do is move them from four to five. So this is, I'm still in the process of articulating what I do. But essentially with these customers, the way I describe it to them is I'm strategic people operations. So what I do is I come in and through these pillars help you make sure that you're building an organization, sort of organization design. Um, and what I've found, the type of work they've asked for is, okay, people, and I will get into each of these in a sec, but it's people, organization design, culture, development, and then inherently there's a bit of strategy in it for a number of reasons, and then it's all about timing, because I'm not going to be focusing on developing your guys when we don't even have them yet. So it's about what's your most pressing need time-wise now. So with people, the, the three main categories are how do I select who, who's going to come in? How do I find them? And you know, on top of that, there's a whole generational shift of how do I, how do I entice the talent to come here? Talent has options, they can go wherever they want, particularly in the, the world today. So how do I make them want to want to come to our company? So when, with selection, I would start with sort of this competence. The model I use is a bit of um, requisite with a bit of other stuff sort of mixed in. And so 
I talk about horsepower. You guys are all familiar with the horsepower aspect. Uh, knowledge, skills, experience, very useful, particularly as a manager. So, you know, that breaks down into different categories of technical versus management. Um, interest in the work. And I'd actually say that there's a, another aspect of interest is here that you can't just be interested in the work now. It has to be interest in the company itself and in, in the purpose of the company. So, um, and I'll explain that in attracting talent, but I, uh, the fundamental part of that hypothesis is that people in my generation care more about what they're doing and they want meaning and purpose from what they're doing, um, that that's more top of mind. And so you're not just fitting them to the role, you're fitting to them to the company. Uh, and then there's maturity and character. So you can move on from there. Um, so when I'm looking at selection, it's really all about fit. And I'd say the three sort of things that come through in the philosophy of what I've been doing consulting wise, three words are fit, alignment, and co-creation and they sort of all go together. So the co-creation is the idea that you can be flexible with how all this stuff's done and if you, you're you more likely, if you go through a co-creative process as opposed to top-down, that you're gonna be aligned with the people you're dealing with because they've had their say and they can incorporate what you're doing. And then the other thing with fit is sort of the same stuff that Bonnie was talking about with Gestalt of not having a vested interest here. And I've noticed this one way or the other. It's I'm not trying to force you into this hole and, and say, do this. I'm saying, if this works great, if it doesn't, we'll find another way. But there's still compromise both ways. So it's like, you can't just, uh, you know, you still have to do work you don't want to do. But we negotiate on how that works. And if there's too much of that, then we talk about how we can maybe find a new puzzle piece to add to the team to take away that work. But it's, um, it's about not forcing it. Um, in terms of attracting, there's, I, I, so there's one a different client I, I'm dealing with who has 25% of the workforce retiring in the next five years. And they don't know how the hell they're going to, A, find the talent, and then how they're going to transfer all the knowledge and skills and experience if they're going to get younger and people who haven't been there. So there's pressure here from the perspective of getting the work done at the right level, you need the right people. And there's those type of people have options in the sort of middle management not that they can go in a lot of different places. So if you move on to the next slide here, here's a model that I don't know, some of you may be familiar with. It's Barrett's seven levels of consciousness. And the way I look at this model is I don't know if it's correct or not in terms of a theoretical perspective, but it comes out of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And when I talk to people my age, or a little older, but in my demographic, that this resonates with them when I use the language here. And so the main point of it is, what do you want out of work? Well, it's not at the bottom. They don't care about how much they're making or if they're gonna survive. They're used to the gig economy. They can go on Fiverr or Uber if they really need something. Eh, they don't care. Um, you know, relationships are more important to them, but it, you know, it's, this is not what they're expecting from work as much. I, I think the, and self-worth and status as well. There's a bit of that. I mean, there's always some of it, but really what I hear is, I don't want a job unless when I leave that job, I'm, I'm a better person than when I started. <clears throat> so they want continuous development. They want coherence, a sense of meaning. So am I doing something that's that's gives me a sense of meaning that's, that's purposeful, and am I making a difference with something? And so there's, uh, an aspect here, I'd say there's two aspects. One would be that if you can fill these needs better, that people think about the, uh, the brand from a customer perspective, and that given the changes in the labor market, you have to now really consider your employee brand just as much. Are people gonna wanna work here? And so I watch the bright kids from, from my graduating class. They know what the good companies are, and they only go there, and it's like, as soon as somebody's worked there and said it's not good, now now the bright ones aren't gonna come. And so it's like the same same type of compounding effect. Um, so if we go to the next slide. Um, now here's a question on how to find them. And so I, this is the one I'm having the hardest time with. Um, at, at this point, this is the most pressing need for me, but I've got a couple ideas. So one is there's a pull effect of culture. If you get it right, you have the same mass piece. If people like working there, then they're gonna, more people are gonna come. And it's the same thing with getting the first few roles right. So 
if you sort of get this cultural architect or the person who's looking internally, so I think about it in the Adizis model, there's external change and then there's internal workings of the system. If you the system's smooth, you have more time to focus out, outside. And you need the second in command person on the 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 CEO's side, and this is sort of the role I've been playing, but sometimes there's also somebody in the company I'm mentoring, that they're they're making sure everything's working inside and they make sure everyone's happy. And so that type of person, um, if they set up the culture you co-created it with them, they're more likely to pull in their network. And all of a sudden you've sort of got, you just got to get the few well-connected uh, couple executives in and then all of a sudden you've got a team that just sort of cascades. Um, I'm dealing with a, um, I'm setting up, well, this is going to take a, a number of years, or one of the ideas I have is setting up sort of a talent bank where from the perspective of an individual, I can help you with your development. So using requisite and using other, other met methods that my, I would be a matchmaker between the clients I have and people are looking to develop and say, look, you would fit this role. This would be a good developmental role for you. So that, that's really focusing on the speed of fix, fitting these hires. Um, the other thing is Don's uh, piece on, on the talent upshift that he had for a while is if he's right that there's a sort of standard deviation move in, in complexity with this generation based on the IQ underlying IQ numbers, then it looks like you have a lot more talent who's coming out of university and not being recognized at three and falling into two work and hating it. So you don't have to pay them anymore, but if you can give them uh, a sense of like, oh, I'm finally doing something that is the right level of challenge, <coughs> I, that's a that's a big opportunity that people are missing because they look and say, "Oh, you're young." Um, and I'd also say maybe immigrant population generally gets overlooked to some degree. And if you have the, the the requisite gives you a measure of objective competence, at least underlying that you can fit the other pieces around, that allow you to look past some of the, sort of the overlooked areas. So this sort of moves into the next pillar, which is culture, and the issue I have with culture is coherence as you grow is sort of, I describe it, it's like um, one of the things is the CEO says, look, I really liked working with these five people, and these are my values, and I don't know how that's going to work when we move, and so there's a balance here of establishing the founder's culture and trying to maintain it, while also allowing some co-creation, because if you come in and that's not your values, a, either you didn't select them right, or they don't like how things are done, there's obviously changes as you move to an organization. And if you, again, if you co-create, you're more likely to align. So you need to be able to articulate in an authentic way the um, purpose, mission, and values, and, and the norms that you want in your organization, and then the narrative of that. And one of the things I think about narrative is there's a, you can use artifacts as the trigger for stories, and you can use narrative as a way to actually, I mean, you can go to the next slide, I think I talked about it. Yeah, so, Maybe it's, it's different at the end. Um, so this is a, I'll get to that later. The, the practical approach, so I worked with Nick Foster as a part of the, the network on a couple of projects and he uses the Barrett stuff in a very, very practical way. Essentially what he does is he says, um, he creates a space where the management team is not dealing with the priorities of the day so that they can have the conversation that's facilitated about why are we doing this and what are we actually doing and does that regularly. And then he cascades that down to the whole organization through a series of workshops as well as surveys. So they have a survey on values and they do, what are your personal values? What are the current organizational values? What do you think the organizational values should be? And the point is that the survey results are not really that useful at all, but the workshop is amazing because now they've started the conversation. And so you're getting people giving these really good examples and stories and because you do it at every level, you get a 360 view of what's going on. And then the beauty of it is they feel like they created the solution and the new direction. So you sort of get these CEOs who are sitting up there saying, we need to make a move going this way. We need the company to come with me, be agile enough, but it won't. And so this is a way of, of sort of coalescing around a change in the business model. And uh, it, it ends up where at the end of it, you've established now where you're going and then you say, well, if you're gonna do that, you actually, here's the story of where you're going and here's what you have to do to do it. Um, so some of the stuff is artifacts are 
an interesting way of looking at this where you don't think about them as just sort of a thing that describes your company. They're triggers for stories. And you're, what you're trying to do is build both a common language and a common identity. And so if you've got pieces of history from your company, whatever, a big win, a big loss, even things that are personal to some of the people there. So it's like, here's, here's, there's a new baby in the company, like we're all very happy about that. Like you sort of have a board of those type of things. That there's, there's um, and just unique stories that are whatever the norm is you're trying to get across, that it really helps with the onboarding and reminding things. And another way to think about it is if you're dealing with, um, if you're, how do I put this? If you're, if you're trying to say, here's our HR policy, we do things this way, and you have a, a word, it's much more powerful if you make that a common language that's based in a narrative. So as opposed to saying the reason that we're very careful with safety is this, you say, here's a story that happened in our company, or here's a story that does this. And so for example, there was one of cutting off both sides of the hand. So this is the idea that you cut off both sides of the ham and puts the ham in the in the oven and the, the daughter asks, well, why do you do that? And, well, I don't know, ask, I just, your grandmother does it. Goes up to the grandmother, asks, oh, well, I don't know, your great, her great grandmother does it. Well, she's coming over, why don't you ask her? And eventually goes and says, well, why do you guys cut off the ends of the ham? Well, I don't know why they do it, the pan was too small. But was, <laughs> the point was, we, don't, we want to look at things in a fresh new way. And as opposed to saying we want to look at things in a fresh new way, the power of a specific narrative that's unique brings that across much quicker and much more likely to build sort of a group identity around using the common language. And the four questions I would say, this is, I, I believe this is Ian uh, McDonald's work, but um, there's four questions that everyone in the organization should know. Uh, and the first one is, where are we going? So this is a, a practical approach that helps with that. The other two, just for reference, are um, what's my work, how am I assessed, and what's my future? So there's another thing that I sort of, this is a model I've made myself based on some more underlying archetypal stuff. So I believe that culture and leadership are very, very deeply entwined. So when you're talking about um, archetypes that leaders use, that sort of, they act out, yeah. Define a leader um, for leadership. <laughs> yes, so, in, well, in this, for, for the use of this model, it's, it's um, I would describe my model as a very work in progress piece. Uh, I think it's at every level in this way, so I'm not necessarily just talking about the top, because I'm talking about the behaviors that in themselves bring people along, so I would describe them as uh, being able to see the world and speak it, so put things into words, and uh, that, that those, are, those are essentially the, one of the main traits of a leader. So it's sort of from that perspective. Um, the point with the cultural model is it's from, the, there's a bit of Elliot in there from trust, and there's a bit of, a lot of Jordan Peterson in there, and a bit of uh, Joseph Campbell. The point is I, have, I, I don't know if I'm missing things or if it's, you know, like I don't know the theoretical basis mm -hmm. for this, but from a, an observation perspective, it's been extremely reliable and useful for me when I'm trying to make a decision. So I'm gonna go over it pretty lightly here. So this is probably gonna be hard to see, but essentially I'll walk you through the, there's three corners to the triangle, and these to me are the three pillars that are in a healthy culture that are sort of, doesn't matter what culture you have. There's a personality of a culture around it, which is your uniqueness, but this is the archetype of what you have to get right. So one of them is the truth, is being able to speak the truth openly in the company. The other one is trust. And uh, the last one, I don't have a better name than the hero, but it's essentially the hero's journey, and it's being able to act out that process. Now, what's important there is that it's the intersection between all of these. So the intersection between truth and trust is integrity. So the way that works is um, if you're... I, I can trust you to act out what you're saying, now I can take you at your word. It's the, the intersection of these two places is being integrity itself. And if you are able to build that in your organization, that gives you as a sort of capability as an organization accountability. And so the way you can think about this is 
it's pretty hard to have a, accountability about roles if, if you're not allowed to speak the truth. And I'm not going to speak the truth if I don't trust you. And I'm also not going to trust you if you don't speak the truth. And, like, you need both of these to be working. Um, on the other side, the truth and the hero. When the hero's journey is in pursuit of the truth, it is the definition of learning, essentially. So it's going out into the unknown to bring back the known. And that is the capacity to innovate, in a sense. That you need both the truth and then the willingness to go out into what you don't know to find out what you know. And the humility to do that. Um, so then the, the last intersection is between the trust and the hero. And the way I think about this is the other hero's journey is individual development. This is um, going out into the unworld to, to improve yourself and figure out what you don't know about yourself and what you don't know about the world to improve yourself. And if you get the trust right, what you have in the organization is aligned development. And uh, you can think about this as giving you the capacity for leadership development for the long term. And I think what's important about that, that point is, is uh, from Barrett's model of what's important to people in terms of values, the thing people are screaming for is development. And if you've got a trusting relationship where I know you're not just going to take everything and run, and even if you do, that's not the end of the world for me, that it's still mm -hmm. valuable for me to teach you, and that you trust the organization's going to like, be fine with you making mistakes and asking to go into a role maybe you're not as good at, and, and, and there's a, that, that element of trust between, between you guys. You have this capability. Now, at the center of this triangle is, is um, I think there's two perspectives. So this is the foundation of the foundations. Is the perspective you have to take when viewing all these pieces is the long-term view. So you can't be doing short-term stuff. This is, and by long-term I mean if somebody's working for me, and there's a better role for them somewhere else, and we've decided that openly, then I'm happy for you to go because in the long term that's goodwill, whatever that is, that I'm going to get back. Um, whether it be a good reputation, maybe you'll come back and work with me, maybe there's collaboration, maybe you're a customer in the future, but the point is I'm not looking just on the short term and making something fit. And so that ties into the second piece, which is I use John Piazza's uh, equilibrated state idea, essentially, of not only you have to look out for yourself, but yourself, your family, then your community, then sort of whatever country, society at large, but the point is the maximum amount of people you can look out for at the same time as well as over time. It's not short term, it's all the way long term. And if you can get to that point, I describe this almost as what Bonnie talked about with you show up, pay attention, and it's really the point of not having a vested interest. It's not, I'm not looking out for what's, I'm not trying to fit you into a role that doesn't fit you, because that's not looking out for you. And in the long run, that's not going to be good for everyone. So if you have that, then there's another mythological story of, of continual renewal of going into the underworld to find the, your father, essentially, who's been swallowed by a whale and bring him back. But the idea is that you're going through um, the ability to adapt to external change. Anyway, you move on. I don't, I, the point is, I have that model. I don't know exactly what to do with it in terms of clients, other than it helps me make decisions on what should our policy be on X, Y, or Z, and, and, and that I need to make sure that these three things are not being messed up. Um, so, with the next pillar sort of being organization design, uh, I call this, how, how are we going to work together? And this, this should be interesting because I also have a lot of confusion about maybe how to approach this and I think the way to, that I've been doing it with my clients is it's whatever works for you. And there's requisite, there's teal, there's whatever else going on and let's try something out. It's sort of a mix of these things. and. I'd say the first thing is you gotta get the work done at the right level no matter what you're doing, um, where possible, or you're predicting dysfunction. So it's, you know, we, if, if we can live with the dysfunction, then that's fine. Um, you gotta get the accountability and authority right, and identifying and assessing roles is where stuff gets interesting. So from a Teal perspective, they do a lot of things where we have a conversation, figure out all the roles that need to be done on the team, and then we say, well, who wants to do what? And you go around and there's different ways of doing it, but there's sort of mixes they're finding. So some of them are, um, there's a role, a, a role assessment process where they say, I, I feel like my role doesn't fit me as well anymore. And so now they start an official process where everyone 
they, they pick the people they'd like advice from, but anyone can self-select in, and then they say, here's what your role should be, and they sort of move around. And a lot of the time, they've been finding that they got the truth and the trust right mm -hmm. enough that people say, I don't have a role at the company. And the company says, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. Why don't you leave? And they do it like, in a very nice fashion. But the, the point here is that it's better for everyone as opposed to them dragging their feet for what they're doing. So um, the point I would say is you still need to get the work done at the right level. You still need the authority and accountability. But that the way in which you assign those, that fit can be co-created in a way that um, brings more likely, more likely to have alignment. And then the other thing they're all trying to figure out is how, how do we run meetings? How do we bring a new person in? And so these are, these are questions of process and, of, uh, and more than one way to do it so you figure out what works with them. So when I was, I have some colleagues who are more on the teal side and what I think the main thing they're missing is, is complexity. And so they have self-managing teams and I've seen it work, but I don't know if you can have, uh, like you can't have a self-managing organization, there's some layer. And so it's about, you can have the team level be more flexible and so the way I describe it is like there's a difference between competence and power. And with RO what you're trying to do is set up a competence structure where people who can do the work are doing the work that is appropriate for what, the, what they should be doing. And that it's not putting people in a caste system. It's, it's the CEO goes and talks to the guy on the ground floor and really respects him as a person and for what else he could add in best advice and in, in all of that type of stuff. And so I think the difference here is there's a flexibility around the relationships at the different levels, but you have to still get people doing the right levels. And um, thinking about it as an adult-to-adult -adult uh, relationship as opposed to command and control. And it's much more of how are we going to do this as a team, but you still need the person who has the ability to take in the big picture to make the decision at the end of the day. So it's more about the process going there. And the other thing is I think if you look at RO, like I think a lot of the teal stuff or how RO is put in sometimes by some, co some consultants gets put off on sort of this from a spiral dynamic perspective on the low sort of bluer beam and that you can do it, it's compatible with a teal perspective where Elliot was looking for mutual trust and respect, he was looking for people to go home and not be horrible at work, like from work and their home life to be disrupted from that and that the, that his whole piece of the best advice and piece of working together was um, calling for this but maybe not as well articulated. So. Um, this is, so again, I, I, I would describe this all as fit in co-creating and it's like, don't get too rigid, don't get too loose on uh, how you're doing things. Um, try to bake the cultural values you want to do into the processes you're making. If you want things to be trusting and you need a, some sort of transparency and vulnerability, then bake that into how you're doing it. And if you're trying to establish trust between people who haven't worked to, together very much, um, so you can imagine you're going from 10 and all of a sudden you have 30 people or then you have 50 and as a CEO you're walking around and you don't know anyone or half the people <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's a big shock. Now when you're having your meetings, combination of an all hands meeting commonly where anyone can say anything to the CEO and there's a, anyone can present anything and you know often they're encouraged to present personal successes and failures that, that week and if, you know, if there's a really big life event that goes up on a board and you make a yearbook at the end of the year of here's our group identity, so it's sort of back to the cultural stuff. Um, but it's the same as like you can start a meeting sort of in the process of here's what's going on with me personally. If you do that as a leader, it, it, it brings up to speed a personal connection between everyone in the organization as long as there's not this, oh, I have to have a certain answer. You've, you've got to get the, the trust right. But it's more likely if you're vulnerable as a leader safely in a, a, a way that adds some personal flair to what's going on. And, um, anyway, so the point is you do that, test and evolve. I'm also working with a company that's um, using space and technology, so they're traditionally in that space and they're moving into consulting with people as well and so I'm sort of bringing that people element. But they've sort of opened up to me, it's like when you're looking at the environment in the office that, you know, how does that work? It has to fit into your processes and it has to fit into your culture. So, then there's development, which I think there are two factors. One of them is, can you make, can you perform better today? And the other one is, 
can you develop leaders? Can you be better in the future? And so, um, you go to the next one here. Um, when I'm looking at development, I sort of use, uh, I mean, the, part of it is you can't help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. But from the experience I've seen that Don's had with clients, that even the, the act of contemplating potential itself is motivating. Meaning that when Don sits back and he's giving somebody an assessment and says, hey, you have a transition in five years where you could be doing this type of work that's like, oh, I had no clue. You know, I don't know enough to do that. I don't have this experience. And all of a sudden, just saying you can do it, it's sort of a fatherly encouragement. And there's a bit that Peterson's been doing. So he talks about writing that I have here. Where, uh, And it's not just Peterson's work. There's a couple of psychologists who've worked on this work. They would get people to sit down and write their future as positive. This is the self-authoring stuff. But the underlying research is write about their future. And they would write positive and negative. So a place to run to and a place that they're running away from at the same time. And that if you look at the underlying effects, they would take um, students, so for example in the Netherlands, um, the poorest forming sort of identity cohort was, was migrant men, or not migrant, but minority men who weren't native uh, in, in the Netherlands. And, and that through this writing program, they were, they were moved up to the highest performing of, of anyone. And it was, oh, I never thought that I could figure out what I'd like to do with my life and use my sense of meaning, which is a deep-rooted instinct, to figure out where I'd like to go. And so the simple fact of doing that can have a big effect both on um, immediate performance and future performance. Um, and the other thing is aligning sort of a development plan. It's as simple as saying with the organization, like, look, we think you have potential. What can we do to help you? What, what do you want to do? And even the fact of that, it's like, look, if you need training, we'll pay for it. If you want to do this, here's a developmental opportunity for that. That, that there's sort of a reciprocity that goes on with that, and it's better for both. Uh, and then the last point I'd say is that you can't think of development just as a, a narrowed piece. Don't think about it as training. I mean, that's you can't just train somebody into it being a level five or however to do that. Um, but also, don't just think of it as mental. Like, mind-body connection is huge. Figuring out that their family life is like the spiritual aspect that, that, that there's a position here to add the whole element of a person. And uh, that, that that goes a hell of a lot farther than just trying to compartmentalize it. And the, the last thing I'd say about that too with the complexity stuff, um, this goes in the face of some of Elliot's stuff. And I don't want to make a claim about it, but from my observation of my life, I'm pretty certain that the coaching I've had from both of my grandparents has affected my development from a complexity perspective. That I can trace back to times where I was thinking about a problem at a certain level of complexity and they said something and it, something went off and then six months later I was able to start that transition and I don't think I would have before. And this has happened more than once. So I'm too early in the process of figuring out how this happened because we had these conversations all the time and then once in a while there'd be a light bulb and I don't know what the, that came from. But it's something about, you can't measure, like observe something without affecting it. And so the fact of me observing it seemed to affect the development. So I mean, that's an interesting area that I'm trying to pursue. If, if you can do some coaching around this and I'm dealing particularly with the clients I'm dealing with who are going from four to five as a CEO, it's like, can I make that any smoother than it is? Um, then with the other stuff, so I, I have a four, four quadrant model <coughs> idea of that you have um, the individual and the group and internal and external and that if you're internal and the individual, this is like your character, your leadership, like all these sort of soft things that are internal to you that it's sort of hard to judge mm -hmm. on the outside um, and that's one area of, of development. and. On the external, it's more, what are your skills, knowledge, experience, and that type of stuff, and that you have to do both of those. On the other half of the quadrant, it's group level, so it's the internal is culture. It's the thing you can't articulate that's sort of internal to the group. And the external is the systems and processes and the way you do things. And um, that, so I, I view my consulting practice as fundamentally in the, the group dynamic, but that I'm also trying to add some services that are individualized so that I go into the company and now I can help with leadership development generally. And so that's going to be 
linking people to whatever training is useful, sort of being a network of that, maybe being an idea exchange in the same sort of way of using the technological revolution of podcast and YouTube and, and uh, maybe introducing forums and webinars and whatnot. And, um, and that's all facilitated through the talent bank. So. So then there's an aspect of talent pool management and development. So from the perspective of the CEO, I can visualize in 30 years, based on the people you have now, what your capability is going to be. And from that, I can tell you, you have what you need. You have more capability than you think. Maybe there's strategic opportunity to expand. You don't have enough. Now we have to figure out how to attract people and start developing them now. Um, and that being able to visualize that is extremely useful also for tech. Figuring out, you know, if, if a new project comes or if a new uh, role is sort of created in the company, who do I give it to? Well, now if I'm thinking about it from the long term as a CEO, I might not just give it to the guy who was able to do this all the time. I'm going to think more about the development of the, the future leaders. I think we need to be uh, uh, cognizant of the time here, John. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, we can move past this. Uh, I just say. I'm pretty much at the end here. This is maybe the last um, pillar that I'm going to talk about. And so compensation, um, felt fair pay is useful culturally because it, it's objective and, and makes that process a lot easier. Um, really useful for attracting and retaining talent because from the CEO's perspective, one of the most common questions is how, do I, how much should I pay them? Well, if I, can, I can tell you that and it's felt fair on both sides. It's been very useful so far. Very useful for modeling. So when I'm saying here's what your business model might look like. We can say, well, look, if you're going to do it that way, you need a four. Here's how much that costs. So then if you get them early enough at the strategic level, then as opposed to, oh, I can't afford the talent, they can price it in while they're building their business model. Mm -hmm. And it also allows managers to delegate this. So the CEO is not figuring out how much everyone in the company should be paid. You can get the right-hand person to do it, and it's systematic and transparent. And then the last one is just broadening compensation to the idea of incentives. And so one of the things I think is everyone should get upside. And the best measure of upside is equity because it's not short term, it's long term, especially if it's a liquid. And it's not how much should I sell. So I'm gonna so for example, with the complex equipment, you could sell that in like 30 different ways, and they have an impact on how valuable they are to the company. You could sell it quickly, but then you're not gonna have the maintenance contract on top of it, you're not gonna have a different type of skew, you're not gonna, like there's, there's all that type of stuff. So the idea is um, you're incentivized based on how the group does, not based on your role. Um, and then just from a cultural norms perspective, you wanna incentivize making doing the right thing the easiest thing to do. Um, so, and yeah, so then the last piece is where are you on this sort of entrepreneurial path that depends what I'm working on. I mean. At certain points, there's um, parts that are more interesting or more pressing, um, but that because of the nature of the speed, you sort of have to think about all that what you're doing. So, and that should be it, I think. Yeah, and the last thing about strategic clarity, I just think about giving people the space <coughs> to solve their own problems um, and um, bringing the, this type of thinking from sort of an administrative level to a strategic proactive level. And that's, that's it. So uh, with that, I would love to, I'm gonna sit down and we can talk okay. there. Or if we wanna have a break or, I don't know. <coughs> yeah. Well, it's very striking um, the complexity that you're considering, you know, looking at this organization. Um, I mean, there's so many variables here. And then to also think, I mean, it's like you have to, it's, it's like an organization or a system. Yep. So you're really trying to look at it just as a system of all of these various you know, functions or pieces within that. So you have to think about each one, but then there's the, the impact of these various functions and pieces on everything else. So I mean, it's a, it's a, it's just striking what a huge undertaking it is in terms of really thinking through each of these different components. It's so, I you know it's like, I mean, even articulating what you have is like wow, just 
I mean, you've done an immense piece of work here, the three of you. <laughs> so I look at it as in order to solve the client's problems, it's probably about a five year job. And it's, uh, this is my plan going forward. And what I'm hoping is as the case studies sort of move, that I have more of a practical, well, here's actually how that worked. Because um, right now I'm sort of at the point where we're in the process of looking for the people to fill the roles we've done. So the stuff about culture and development, like that stuff hasn't been touched yet. Um, but I can see it as a pressing need. So, um, yeah. And, and so, wait, sorry, you go ahead. Um, I was wondering the, the, the difference between objectives and tradition. Mm -hmm. There are too many organizations that, that operate on tradition without knowing in a, any clear way what their objectives are. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, part of what I've seen is there's um, a need to create the space at that level of conversation of what, what's the purpose of this organization? What are we trying to organize to accomplish? And it can be very easy to sort of habituate into what we've always been doing, even though the external's changing. And so the, the simple process of giving the space to the leadership team or the whole organization to say, like, what are we doing, um, can help if, if you're stuck in tradition that's maybe not fitting the outside world anymore or fitting what you guys are trying to actually do, that having that conversation is good. And I think one of the things about culture is um, you want to, so I think about it as sort of the opposite of the knowledge process. So knowledge seems to go from procedural, meaning you act things out, to narrative or, or um, like story-based or image-based, artistic-based level of knowledge where somebody's recognizing a pattern but in an artistic fashion and then eventually you can articulate what's happening. And so I look at culture as if you don't have all those three things in alignment, then you don't have a healthy culture. It rings worse than it is. So if your tradition is going in this direction and your leader's going in that direction, um, or, if you're, or if your mission statement or whatever says something and it's complete hollow, you know they don't actually hold those values, however that works, then it does more damage than having nothing. And so um, you have to be able to drill down from the fact of we've first come uh, um, together to figure out what we're trying to do as an organization and have that conversation, and then not just put a slogan out. How do we change the whole system so it reflects it? Well, Josh, um, that, that could you tell us about the conversation that you have, or these leaders have together? How do they make space and time for that? Because they must just be going crazy trying to do everything that they're yeah. doing. Yeah, this is part of my job, I think, yeah. um, where it's very, very easy to push this sort of high-level thinking past the emergency time. But if you don't do the pre-planning, it's going to go a hell of a lot worse for you. So I make a point of saying, you need to be thinking about this and you need to talk to me. So we try to have a regular call, whatever that's weekly or twice a week or, or whatever, but it's even just an hour. It's look, I don't care if you can do all your prep for it, but you need to have this in your consciousness, yeah. subconsciously working on it. And and uh, I I view it as anything, I, I can't come up with the answers for you, but I, I can do a lot of this sort of bringing up things as I model out the organization. So. My job, in a sense, is creating the space for them to think about it themselves, but then supporting them with a lot of the groundwork. And we've we found that in order to not be, you know, A, too costly, but also a burden on my time, is, is looking for somebody in the organization at level three or four who I can mentor to implement or take on some of this stuff and be on the ground. Because part of the issue is um, I'm not there for a month. <coughs> have the new people but like I can tell you how to onboard but you know the CEO is not going to do it he doesn't have the time so it's getting that role filled and then I have a relationship with that person as well as the CEO okay what struck me as the biggest missing piece the biggest mistake companies make when they scale 
is they grow, allow themselves to grow organically. Mm -hmm. That's to say, when you're a small business, you develop ways of doing things largely based on the personalities of the people who are building the business. Yeah. When you scale, that doesn't work. Yeah. You have to go from informal to formal processes. And that means the opportunity is to ask the question, not the language you used, which was, how should we do this that will suit what we want to do, but rather, what's the best way to do it? Yeah. And there's enough information out there, for example, just looking at, you take any IT system that you might be looking at to support a process, they're all in seventh or eighth generation. They've all worked out best practices. Mm -hmm. So you can figure out what's the best way to do this, not yeah. what's most suitable to the way we did things when we were small, but what's the best way to do it. And that's the right way, not the cultural right way. It's the right way. Because yeah. that's the business model. And that means that one of the missing pieces that you're looking for in your management is discipline. Yeah, I, and I think, this, I think this is where... The discipline to actually build the process, formalize it, and stick to it. Yeah, and I think this is where the timing piece is. So it's like the first, um, you think about it as like you need to perform. This is the Adizis model of PAEI. Yeah. That you've got to be thinking big picture in the entrepreneurial sense and performing. <clears throat> but once you're at the point where now you've got, you're, you're expanding beyond the small team that you still have to perform, but as soon as you can, you have to be administrative and, and make this efficient. And that means formalizing the processes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and that requires the discipline, not just to build the formalized methodologies, but, but to stick to it. But stick to it. Yeah. And that's probably the most single important factor versus all of Mickey's business yeah. in process improvement is companies that grew organically and now they're in trouble. Yeah. And all he's doing is going in and saying, well, here's the best way to do it. That's what you should have done. Ten years ago. Yeah, that's essentially what he's been doing. He gets paid a lot of money for doing this. Part. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and this is this is where I think the integration is so powerful. It is powerful. Exactly. But I mean, but yeah. the thing, but when you're talking with your companies, your clients that are going through this transition from sort of small to medium to large, mm -hmm. the first thing they have to pay attention to is what's the right way to do each of the functions, not based on the personality of the person who's been doing it as a small company, but what's the right way to do it. Because if they build best practice right into it now, yeah. as they grow and that stays with them, they can continue to scale. So yeah, and so I think there's a distinction between, um, like is a lot of the systems process you're talking about, you're right about that. Uh, but I think there is a place for some of it that's more personality based on how do we have meetings. Now, oh, yeah. and that type of stuff, yeah. well, and what's, what's our norms? But I think, yeah, you're right, like the thing that, I just don't have enough experience or knowledge of this is the more formalized systematic like I don't and information flow. I mean a lot of the IT stuff. I, well, it's not, I'm yeah. not just talking about but, IT, I'm just yeah. talking about if you take yeah. any process like what's okay, we're we're building we're building vendor relationships. Okay. There's all sorts of information out there on best practice performing vendor relations. Well so I I have a yeah. question here which is which in, what intrigues me here is what is the resistance that inherent in people to go out and look for the best practice rather than just well let's just do this uh, it's the pressure of the speed yeah and so yeah. basically the way you can think about it is um, well our client who like whatever this new group of clients we're at capacity or past capacity and I'm already working 12 hours a week I just have to get this out the door and they're not taking a step back to say well how's you know, it might be slower this week, but now, or, you know, for the amount of time it takes to get the system fixed, but now it's going to be a lot smoother and more efficient. Well, so I, I think on this point, um, there is also a need for reflection. You know, when something is done to say, well, how well did that work? That's right. You know, yeah. you know maybe under pressure and speed, we do something, but then do we step back and say, how did that work? What yeah. could have been better? And, and these are some of sort of the other processes that I've talked about. So part of uh, like one of them that I've seen be very useful is, is that there's a full team meeting even as the team grows and it can be half an hour really quick where the key people talk. And, and at the beginning everyone talks about what they're doing. And then there's a kick up, but you're closing the circle of here's what we said we needed to do this week. Here's what's changed and what happened and what now needs to happen next week. And we just keep doing that circle. But the point is that if I learned something that was really important, now it sort of gets transferred a bit more organically. Um, but it's about building in, okay, 
so part of what I do is I'm saying, here's what I'm doing from a people side, I'm sort of supporting you. And as the CEO, I want you to try this, or if I'm trying, either way, that, that sort of dialogue comes back after the test. And if there's uh, specific processes that are going in, you have to make it very clear to them that it's, it's not just here's your job to do this, it's here's your job, but part of your job is, is figuring out what works and what doesn't and communicating that. So it's, it's sort of preemptively getting the conversations to happen. So I, I view myself as creating the space, not just for me to have the conversations, but make it in their calendar that they have to have this conversation when, when they need to. Yeah. The, the, the notion of um, the new demographic, um, and, and for example, you talked about the importance of, that, that the company they work for is important to them as the work. Any idea how tight that is? Uh, you know, like for years I've been reading stuff that says, uh, oh, you know, this company has an exciting mission. Because you know, and that that's just that's my yeah my personality rather than this culture. But how tight is the? Well, I, I think the way I think about it is is there's a, if I could sort of give you the archetypal person for my yeah. demographic coming out, they would be saying something like, it's called fun. "I can get money where I need to get money, and I probably won't be owning a home for a while or whatever." Mm -hmm. And I've seen my parents go to work and hate it, and I don't want to do that. And I've also seen my parents tell me at the end of my life that family is important and that health is important. So I want that to be integrated into my life. So what they're saying at work is, I need something that fits into the lifestyle I'm dealing with. It's not important to be rich or status. I'd like those things, it's not like those went away. But then there's this big sense of sort of grappling with the nihilistic feeling of like, I'm not doing anything but a cog in a machine. And, and so the feeling is more, what's a problem that's interesting? Now. It's not everyone. I, I'd say the one that's more prevalent is the idea of development, because not enough people have been said you can. You, there's potential in you. Let's do something. I think if you even just started with that, you'd do a good job with most companies. It doesn't. They don't care if they're working on widgets or whatever, as long as you're developing them. But if you can tie it into something that's meaningful, that that does have an effect on people. And um, I mean, my girlfriend took a job. Um, specifically for the developmental aspect of it. But she doesn't care about the tech. I mean, it's a SaaS company, and it's whatever. But um, if a job came along where she thought it was developmental and it was something she actually cared about, she'd be more likely to go do that, and she'd take less money to go do it. So it's a, there's a, I think from a practical perspective as a business, the one that you should care about more is development, because I think that's more universal than purpose and meaning, but I do think there's a lot of people who are sort of quietly dealing with that and and voicing it but not, not really understanding it. And I, I think a lot of companies, if you pay like cheap words to it in terms of mission <coughs> statement, it's not going to work. And there's not a lot of companies that are actually drilling down what's going on up here to all the way down. It's um, sort of the Part of it's the feeling that if you have a genuine mission up here, and it's to the point where the CEO actually thinks the janitor is really helping with that, that's what people are looking for. It's like, what I'm doing is connected to what the organization is doing, and what the organization is doing doesn't have to be solving world hunger, but it's making somebody's life better somewhere. I'm, yeah. I was also curious when you talked about compensation being affected by the group, mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking of that. Dilbert cartoon you know, says, well, as long as my bonus doesn't depend on what I do, could, could it depend <laughs> on what this other company, company's profit is? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it feels, uh, I have all kind, you know, and the, part of this is, is the RO that's baked into me. Yeah. But it, it feels irresponsible on the part of the company. It feels. Yeah, so the way I think about it is, um, with this particular type of company, there's sort of a different distinction. If you've got to a point where you have a model that's working in your own, not in the search, but in the execute phase, and it's much clearer for me to tell you what your role is, yeah. then that makes a lot more sense um, to tie a certain portion of your money to at risk, but at risk on an individual level. Um, in this type of situations, because everything is so fluid and there's such an ask from you, so for example, my girlfriend, the first three months of her job, she's working 12 hours a day, every day. And she might go in on a Saturday, 
but she's fine about it because she feels like an owner of the company, even if it's a small bit. And that, that there's a, almost a need when you're asking for so much from somebody to give them sort of an ownership in this type of a scaling atmosphere, because if she just stuck with what her role was, the company would be failing. She does everything <laughs> at times, and everyone does everything at times. And so I think there's there's this sort of um, s amount of time in the life cycle that you you need the group to act together and not to be worried about are they getting their bonuses on individual performance because that's not been sorted but, out yet. But but what you're saying is part of my job is to help these other people. It, it's, yes. Right. I mean. Yeah. It, I, I still look at that and I say. <laughs> You know, so I'm the one who comes in on Saturdays, and that boosts the group, and other people don't come in on Saturdays. But, yeah, and so this is where there's a, I haven't been able to articulate it as well, but this is where the cultural piece is really interesting, where, where it's sort of like a renegotiation of everything, so this is where the flexibility and co-creation is, where the group has said, so for example, my girlfriend can leave at 2 p.m., as long as she doesn't have a very important meeting, um, and go have lunch with a friend, or go to the gym, or go, like, if she needs to take a day off, you don't have to tell anyone why. And they're not they're never going to dock your pay. They don't care. And, you know, if you need a vacation every three months, it's fine. If you need a vacation, you can take as much vacation as you want as long as you're recharged to work. You're, you're doing your job. And so that's been negotiated with, okay, now I want to feel like I'm a part of this as a group. And I want to feel that part of that is being paid as a group as opposed to, like, it feels like a real win. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. Well, there's something that they used to say in Nick and Johnson, which was, you know, BS, but <laughs> when we worked there. But they used to say there's psychic income. And my girlfriend has a name, and her name is Kate. Yeah. And so Kate comes for dinner at 8 o'clock at night when the dinner was late, a couple of hours earlier. And I say, oh, too bad you're working. Oh, I couldn't believe I worked so long today. It was just wonderful. I just had a. Yeah. a and, and that's sort of like it is day after day. Now it's only been three months. <laughs> but you know, if there's something yeah, about yeah. the excitement of being on that team mm -hmm. that and it, I don't know how long it yeah. lasts, but it's very interesting. Well, and I still say, like, you're still loving it, and it's like every second of it. And mm -hmm. there's still an aspect of trying to find life, work life balance, but there's a piece of I know what the stage of the company is. I'm, I'm, they look after me, I'm going to look after them. And there's a and that's ownership. Yeah, and that's the yeah. ownership. And, yeah. and for me, it's about it's alignment. So it's like um, there's a different amount of, of, like you're trying to align sort of at a deeper level where it's not um, do this for me and I will pay you this. It's like come into the family, you're one of us. And then that's a different ask. And if you're doing that, a way to show that you're actually doing that is, is through the compensation. Mm -hmm. and, but, yeah. Sorry. Just, just, Okay. One other question. Left. Yeah. You talked about welfare pay, and, I, and I'm really curious the the welfare pay curves that that we refer to in requisite have a very thin um, uh, <laughs> research basis. Yeah. Right. I, I believe it's three studies, all in Western uh, companies. The one that I read was, I think, all engineers. I think all men. Um, and a very so I'm really curious whether the whether this holds. Um, yeah, um, I'd say so far so good, but I haven't done it on a big enough scale to see if it's working. But um, like one of the CEOs, I was saying, look, like here's sort of what we're expecting to budget for a level four guy in this sort of area. I said, yeah. You know, it's more expensive than I would have liked, cause what, but he's thinking that he could get it done at three before I was yeah. coming around. So that was sort of his budgeting. It's like, oh, I'll pay somebody, whatever. Mm -hmm. But, but, yeah, it was about right so far. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the... So what do you, what's X? Yeah. What do you consider? In that one, it's 90. But we're in Western Canada, so 90,000. 90. 90 really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Toronto, we're using 100. Yeah. Um, it feels like it's been 100 for 20 years, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and so this is the, it'll be interesting. I'm interested to see if it's holding up too. And I think maybe the, the part that's useful is not even necessarily the validity of it being felt fair as much as it being a system that makes it feel felt fair. <laughs> that, that, that it somehow corresponds to the weight of the role I'm holding up. Yeah. And that 
it's a reasonable multiple and that um, I know that there's a future for me if I'm doing the type of work and it's not just did I negotiate better, like there's an actual system to it. Yeah. Um, so, but the question will be is it, you know, are we using the right multiples or the right number and all that? Okay, thanks. Well, can I ask a question about that? Uh, felt fair pay, I don't know very much about it, but I know that the little bit that I learned about it felt fair to me. Uh, and does it, does felt fair, does felt fair pay take into account developing people according to their requisite yeah. trajectory? So the way we is think of, part of well, the way we think about it is you have so you've got your levels of complexity and you've got your bands yeah. in it. So you've got high, medium, low, and I've actually used the term A, B, C because I don't want people to think that it's low is low because it's just a different role. So I've used A, B, C. We'll see if that is confusing or works. C is uh, lower than D. I actually did it the opposite way. I said you come into a role. The first, the first level of the role is A. So you, I, I viewed it not from top down, but it's like you came in, so you're at A, and then you graduate to B and C. And so the idea, like I'm trying to sort of get some of that judgment out. Yeah. Um, and so then within those bands, you have six pay grades, and we divided them into the two halves. So it's developmental and then satisfactory. So you can think about it as uh, D1. It's like you're just new to the role. You maybe don't have the knowledge, skills, experience. You're probably pretty bad at this. But you've got the horsepower you need to learn. And then as we find, as, as we review this, however regularly that is, I mean, uh, a lot of the startup companies I'm dealing with are doing it six months, three months, or whenever you feel like you're doing something different. It's sort of like that. Um, but then you move up to satisfactory eventually. And depending on the role, some of these roles, so there's one for reasons they didn't want to make a distinction between different levels of work in technicians, but the technicians would go from low one to high two. And so depending on the role, you have a corresponding table saying how high the role could go. and then the conversation is around sort of, well, how well are you doing this job in comparison to others, and then all the other factors taken into account. Um, talk a bit more about um, co-creation. Yeah. Um, no, but, th but once when you were talking about it, um, yeah, I, I had the impression that that perhaps employees were also co-creating um, maybe the, the mission of the company or the direction of the company. You know, what, could you talk more about co-creation? I think as we talk further, I'm hearing some other things, what's meant by that, but I'd like yeah, you to speak um, more about that. What I mean by it is, is when there are important decisions or even unimportant decisions in the organization that that there's a voice coming from the other side and that that the idea that a good idea can come from anywhere in the organization even if they don't have the level of complexity that yeah. you, you know maybe they can spark something yeah. but the same piece is like if they feel their voice is heard and they've had some impact on what's um, the direction that they'd like to see things go that they're more likely they feel like they had a, a part in creating whatever that is so from a mission perspective it's like well what really are we doing and you know that's a bit different than saying how should we run meetings and you're going to get different answers from different levels but um, it's as simple as opposed to coming in and saying here's where we're going as saying here's the issue here's what I think what do you think and taking yeah. in all the yeah. but it's um, maybe a, a way of phrasing that 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 gives sort of a sense of ownership no, the, the time is always the challenge to do this. Where people find the time when they're really pressed yep. to do that because they put it aside because we have to do production or we have to do whatever it is. Yeah, well, particularly I've seen the CEOs seem to be very, they're the ones who particularly may not go on the norms that they'd like to set yeah. and can very easily have too many things on their mind and not do it. Yeah. And so this is why I think partly my role, but also the person who's there every day, who's sort of their, I, I don't have a name for them, but it's, they do people and operations, sort of the internal of a company. 
then it's their job that we've decided and we've all agreed that this is how we're going to act and this is our process for a meeting. The account of, like, the, uh, they're being held to account by this internal person. That's their job, sort of the hive mind and making sure people are, are upholding the way that they said they would act. So this is the word discipline. You know, this is, if you can instill that yeah. discipline, that this and, is, I'm yeah. going to just say, it's a core value, but it's, it's an essential. It's like, you know, there are other essential things you have to do in your company. Like you have to compensate people, you know, as an example. Yeah. But it's really building it in as a discipline, as a core element that even though we're busy, we're going to make the time to do it. Yeah, and I think there's an aspect of it that's um, the point I'm making is you actually need a role at a high level whose job it is to do that essentially. As the, the accountability internal, thing and, can happen. And somebody who, if you're looking from a, a big five personality perspective, would be very, very orderly, organized. Mm -hmm. And that that helps balance generally the openness of the CEO. We're also, we're also not talking about really large organizations here. We're talking about small organizations where the face-to-face -face well, can be yeah. formed. But, but that's only at the beginning. I know, yeah. but that's when it starts. Yeah. That's yeah. the trap. And that's what you were saying. Is yeah. At the beginning, you need to put in the discipline. Yeah. Sorry, that's the trap, is that everybody knows everybody and knows how to do it. And as you get too big, I agree. that's what breaks down. That, yeah. And that's why you need to supplement it with more formal ways of doing things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, you need to, and you need to define the rules much more precisely. Yeah. And your, your comment about somebody you know, sort of being jack of all trades, doing little bits of everything, that has to stop. Yeah. And people have to say, this is my defined role, and I have to stay within those roles because other people are counting on you to yeah. play that role a certain way. And what an exciting, <laughs> interesting consult. And certain outputs. And certain outputs, that's right. An yeah. interesting consulting role to be in that place where all that churn is happening. Exactly. I mean, oh, and sure. it takes very little to make it work. That's the other piece. Things, in my experience, <laughs> you can do, if things are in chaos, it takes very little order to make a huge difference. Correct. And it can't be done from the inside. It needs the outside perspective to make that happen, which is where the consulting role works. That's yeah. exactly. So it's a great opportunity. It is. It's it's perfect. <laughs> the other thing, I question I've got is how you're tying all this, um, I'm going to call it the management control system because I'm going to use the formal term. But you've got sort of mission, vision, values, which then leads to uh, what you're trying to be when you grow up, um, which then leads to the critical success factors, which then lead to key performance indicators. And they all have to align as you work your way down through a fastly growing organization. You can't have the left hand be measured on uh, stuff that doesn't align with what the right hand is being measured on. Otherwise, nothing starts to work. And that's where a lot of the dysfunction is uh, as organizations grow. So how are you uh, addressing this, getting down this integrated approach to um, how they measure and make sure that the measures actually align with each other as they continue to grow and develop and develop these more formalized rules? How do you plan to tackle that? I don't think I have a plan yet. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which, is, which is good that you brought it up. Because I, I think there's a... The point uh, in the company where I am now, uh, they're still small enough, despite the fact that they're growing, that the relying on sort of the social capital that they have is working. Um, so I haven't run into the problem yet of, of the formalization, but I can see it happening <laughs> soon. So um, yeah, top of mind, I don't have a solution for it yet. But, yeah. Well, and I, I can see. Um, that so so what you've just said Bill ties into something I was thinking a little bit earlier is about uh, uh, how you get consulting assignments and how you get to scale. So I was thinking how you sign scale your business, but and part of that I think is that the work that I am so blown away by what you, like you see, like every word is gospel. <laughs> um, um, and I want to talk lots more about this, uh, but, but the client, you, if you can stay in with the client, you will be there 
at every growing stage of complexity for them, and they will always be prepared for it well in advance. Right, so you will meet clients, I, I think you just used the word chaos, right? Like, yeah. you'll meet clients that are in chaos. Uh, I meet lots of clients that are in chaos. And, I, no, I think it was you. I think so. Yeah, yeah, that was brilliant. Oh, I wrote it down. You. Oh my God, thank you. Know, you. <laughs> and I, wrote, I probably wrote your initials. I, I wrote your initials. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, I, I think that's, yeah. it, it's organic. Yeah, and, it's organic. and for me, it's the same sort of thing. If, like, there's a, if you can get in early with a company and really solve this problem, yeah. then it's a, like there's a chance that it'll repeat business for very long, like for the life cycle. Yes. Um, but it's the same thing where it's not necessarily what I'm trying to do. You just sort of show up and out, and believe in reciprocity. If it's not a good fit, then it's not a good fit later. But um, that hopefully, if you can get this stuff right at the root, that yeah assuming there's not too much turnover at the high end of this, that they sort of know what to expect if there's another transition type thing, or if they're going to buy through gate, or if they're completely changing their business model. Um, or if leaders yeah. are leaving that particular <coughs> business because yeah. they've lost interest in yeah. the trajectory, then now you've got two clients. Yeah. It's like the shampoo commercial. Or Smurfs. Well, or whatever they were. <laughs> Smurfs. <laughs> Well, I can see from from my perspective that the big problem coming down my road is is cap is uh, a yeah. capacity. Yeah. Where <laughs> if if I'm doing a hundred complexity interviews <laughs> or whatever, like, then that's my full time thing. But I'm trying to do all this other stuff. So um, I've been working with a bench really as to where I think you have to collaborate as an independent consultant yeah. in order to have a flexible bench. Mm -hmm. But also on top of that, I'm trying to. Uh, figure out how I can teach other people to take parts of what I do that are digestible and have that at an implementation level where I can stay up at the strategic level. Um, so my plan in three or four years is to have that in place so that I don't drown myself and that I can myself scale but then you know the sort of the irony of I, I can see all the same problems that I'm helping clients with happen to me, and I can't necessarily solve them myself because I'm playing a different role. So it's uh, it's a bit I you know I don't want to be too ironic when I'm to yeah. growing. So I've got to think about how I'm going to deal with that. But well, it's good because it makes you empathetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, and, and that's been very useful for me as I I I can see what they're going through. Yeah. It's the same stuff. Maybe they'll be helping you. Yeah, maybe. So one of the things you might want to think about with this is when you're talking to your clients, is help them to actually articulate their business operating model. Yeah. What the model looks like. Actually articulate it as a narrative or a story or whatever format works for them. Yeah. So when you've got, when you understand your business operating model, there's two things that happen when you scale. Uh, one is your business operating model changes, so you have, have to know where you where, where you got now and what's changing too. Yep. But it also gives you the opportunity to design what that operating model should look like yep. to be able to deliver on what you're going to commit to. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that if you haven't formalized it or at least articulated it up yep. front. So it's not just about the mission, vision, values, and how that works in terms of culture. You need to really understand. The business operating model itself, and yep. you have to understand fear, fear granularity. Yeah, this is where I have the Excel piece, where it's like you <coughs> sort of transfer that into a narrative format, but from the granular perspective, it's like I need to know everything that you're doing and what are the variables, even if you don't know them, the answers to what they're going to be, yeah. and that that we use that as a uh, a conversation piece. So it's like particularly at the stages they're at, we don't know the answers, we have our best guesses, but we know a lot of it's going to change. But you have to give the space so they're thinking it through, because often that sort of gets lost in the just performing. Okay, so one of the things that you can do in your role, which would be an enormous benefit, is to do research in how other companies, even if different disciplines area, how did they solve that problem? Mm -hmm. And if you can identify these guys had a very similar problem, and even though it's not your industry, <coughs> they solved it, 
if that can translate into something you can deliver as a way of thinking about stuff, yeah. then you bring great value to that organization because now you're, in effect, you're, but they don't have the time because they're running with the speed. They don't have the time to go and ask yeah. all this stuff. You do. Yeah. Right? And that's part of the role that you should be playing is how do I take solutions that, I, that are out there somewhere and bring them to my client? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think when I, when I look at myself in terms of value add, I have the horsepower and I have some knowledge, skills, and experience that's yeah. been developed. But that's where I really need to add. And so it's like, by going through a couple of these cases, not only spending the time to go look as broadly as I can, but it's like, once I have a couple of these under my belt, it's much easier for me to say, well, this is this is what this problem was with these three businesses, and here's how these three solved no, it. No, 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 no. Before you even get there, yeah. you're, 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 you're jumping too far ahead too quickly. It's start, if you can articulate what the problem is, you've yeah. got this growth problem, they, they're going to have this, say, vendor relation. So you go out and you do research on what, how does you know, Procter & Gamble solve that vendor relation for them, whatever it is. I mean, it's all out there. The information's yeah. there. They don't have the time to look that up. But if you can say, okay, here's how these people solve that problem, would that work for you? That gives them something to think about. At least it gives them a baseline. Yeah. And they know that it works because it's been solved elsewhere. None of the stuff these guys are going through is new. Mm -hmm. Everybody's, any big company has been through it. I think, it's new. Sorry, I, I wonder about that, Bill, and I, I like, but my curiosity would be, um, it's 30 years ago when I left, wherever I left, they were talking about the rapids change. Yeah. Well, you know, they didn't foresee how fast it was going to be today. So I wonder if a Procter & Gamble case study would be, you know, I just wonder. I understand. Okay, it may not be Procter & Gamble, but yeah, the point but is, so the answer where, is out there somewhere. I agree. But it's interesting to yeah. think of the thinness yeah. of the experience in this speed of change. Now, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe it's, and I do agree that most, most things are the same with different labels. Yeah. But um, I, I, I just wonder about the thinness of experience. And it feels more, much more experimental. But I may have been intermittent. Well, I may I, have been influenced. I, I think the thing is, if you look at these other examples, but um, what can you take from it? Yeah. Not wholesale. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like adapt. You know, what's relevant, what's not relevant. Um, I think, and it could be that you can find some current companies that have gone through this, where you could have some face-to-face -face collaboration with, you know, a company executive. You know, they bring together your client and some of these other people. They could meet other people, so it's more live and current than you know, on paper research. So, so that's another possibility. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that's really interesting is people move higher up in these larger organizations. They love to talk about how successful they are. That's true. <laughs> so it's that's easy to get meetings with them. As long as you're not asking them for a job or for money, yeah. it's easy to get to talk to them. Yeah. So just go and ask them, how, did you have this problem? How did you solve it? Yeah. And they'll tell you. And all the old war stories are really interesting. Exactly. Even if they're only two years ago. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And even if, even if, you, if they hear the answer and go, it's going to work for my client, May not this time, but the next client or two clients down the road may be the great answer. Yeah. And you may even have an opportunity to then hook up some of these people so they can hear for themselves how it was solved, and that creates a new network for your client, yeah. which is also important. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to uh, objective versus tradition. Um, and I brought it up because uh, one of the best examples I've come across <coughs> was in Ellesmere Island. Uh, the area south of, of Alert, which was a, uh, I guess it still is, uh, listening to the, to the restaurants. <coughs> uh, but south of there, there, there was a fair bit of mess on uh, Lake Argue, which is uh, to the south and west. And uh, people were going in, and people with lots of money would go in there and and dump their fuel, fuel uh, drums on the side of the runway and, and uh, do their hunting and fishing and go back to the States and stuff like that. 
So um, my concern was that the, the place was being just messed up. And so there's an easy way to solve it. We'll make it a national park. And, um, and I said to the fellow who in Winnipeg who was uh, responsible for that section of uh, Parks Canada, I said, just one person for five months of the year, because nobody's going to go there the rest of the year anyway. And uh, low cost, but it'll accomplish this objective. And about three weeks later, I got a, um, an email from a uh, letter from him saying that they needed all of the, all of the uh, components that he was going to need uh, were going to add up to about three million dollars. And I said, no, 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 you didn't hear that. The objective is one person goes there for five months, so he needs a place to stay, and that's it. And um, the military cleaned up all of the drums and stuff like that. Um, it's worked fine ever since, because all it took was was that it, it had nothing to do with the national park. It was the national park gave the the basis for having somebody there and having some criteria, and so it continues to operate with one person for five months. Mm -hmm. and it was the objective of the intervention. Pardon me. It was the objective of the intervention. The objective, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the objective had nothing to do with a fancy park yeah, and, you know, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. It had to do with keeping that place clean. That's a very good question. What exactly is your objective? Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me or for my clients? For, you? for me. Um, what is it you hope to achieve? Oh, for me, there's a number of things sort of at the same time. I, I'm, and I'd say the foundational one is I want to understand this stuff so for me it's a bunch of case studies I'm trying to develop ideas um, and and sort of at a knowledge level um, and then that will let me do a number of things in the future uh, other business opportunities as well as things partly it's a personality thing if I just like to understand and write about it but um, so for me it's a bit of that case study and, and from a meeting perspective it's uh, I think the thing that spoke to me about Elliot when I first read some of his stuff was the, and because I I have a friend whose dad worked at one of the big banks in Toronto and like the pain that his whole family felt because this guy was miserable at work. That, that that's the type of stuff that I'd like to, uh, from a meeting perspective, feel like I'm doing something about is is sort of. Um, making the workplace a more whole and effective vehicle for humanity to achieve whatever it needs to achieve, but in a way that doesn't chew out the people who are in the organization and, and sort of make a mess of their lives. So have you now, so with each of these clients, I assume that you have a slightly different objective in terms of how you're going to, what you're going to achieve in your intervention. Mm -hmm. And have you articulated that and written it down? No. <laughs> Next time. Yeah. So, um, something that just keeps coming to mind for me is um, often as consultants we're working with clients to solve a problem that they have. I mean, that's basically you know largely what we're doing. Um, instead of tackling the problem directly. Another concept is to begin with the end in mind. To start with what is it we want to achieve and have, and to start and then reverse engineering that, to, to try to work from that perspective. And I, I needed to say that because, um, so then you're thinking about, about it from, a, I think, a very different place. Because when we start tackling problems, Usually we get into thinking from present thinking solutions versus creating something that might be, you know, a totally different. So um, I would just like to put that out there. Maybe you're already doing that, but you know, to engage your client team 
in thinking about the end in mind that they would like to see for their organization. And, and, and to know that that's still fluid because it's going to keep evolving as they evolve and the organization evolves. But I think that that's a good place to, that's a good place to be starting from. And, and then that, it also requires thinking about the changes that we see in the next 5, 10, 20 years because, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking long term. Um, so I think there are some things to think about there. Yeah. Excuse me, Josh. Yes. I didn't find lunch, but I found a can. <laughs> I'm here. Hey, I'll take it. So would you like to introduce them? Sure. Well, everyone here knows Ken. Hi. Hey, how are you doing? Good. Good. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hey, Zay. Hey, see you. Carolyn Arnold. Carolyn. Jim Collins. Jim. Or Selena, I guess. Beautiful. It's cold in here. Yeah. Yeah. It's cold in here. I'm enjoying this. We're just uh, winding this up. Right. So, uh, Cool. Well, we, the only thing we need to do for sure is to track down the food that should be yes. in by now, but isn't. Yeah. So I'm going to take a break here and do that. And let me just de declare this session over. And thank you very much, Josh. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Presentation. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Amazing. I have to say, it's the first time, I think maybe ever, that I have thought about work and thought, actually, maybe it wouldn't be bad to go back and do <laughs> I spent all my working life in organizations that were thousands of people with a culture that had been, you know, defined over time. And, and I mean, I just totally and completely agree with all of your ideas and concepts, but I cannot overlay it. And some of these organizations still exist. So I'll be really interested to see, as you go through your development, whether you can take some of these and help organizations that are, are what is it, mature? Anyway, yeah. a bit of ramp. Because when you start talking about culture, it, it, it's like Jim's example. Because yeah. we've always done it this way. And people, even when they're miserable, uh, in that kind of context, very often it's very hard to bump start them out of the yeah. rut. The, so the, really, the catalyst really for change is sort of different in there. Yeah. It, it's, uh, and the problem of scaling is so glaringly a catalyst, like a problem that it's a catalyst, but if you're sort of habituated into this is the way it's always been. It's 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 the old it's the it's your hand you need to spark before this you can is the way start. we've done it. Yeah. And you know, God help us. Now hopefully the external environment will be enough different. Yes, one yeah. I mean zero, we'll, we'll five, all five, and, yeah. you know, jostle around it. But but it, it just will be fascinating to me. So well and that, that's that. what I like about starting with the narrative, right? Like that's that's a huge difference in oh, giving yeah. more, making a oh, distinction you know, between you know, tradition. Totally. And totally. Totally. It's a wonderful Hello. opportunity. Hi. Hi, I'm Kate. I know. Okay. <laughs> that's right. I don't expect to be yeah. memorable. <laughs> oh, so. Oh, that was really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's, 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 that's,